really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. By architectural thinking we mean the whole wide world that architecture engages and what we are interested in is where the frontiers of that world are and where they might be in the future. Today I'm talking to B. V. Doshi, the famous Indian architect who recently turned 90 and who as such has seen the entire world of modern architecture and its aftermath mature through the second half of the 20th century. I called him up at his office in Ahmedabad. Welcome to Architecture Talk, Professor Doshi. No, no, thank you for our getting this occasion so that we can talk and chat and kind of connect ourselves. Yes, our real inner selves. And you are now 90 years old. Yeah. Congratulations. How does it feel to be 90? So what happens is that time flies and I always remember and recollect only one thing, that the river is one thing which has impressed me the most. Because when I always talk, I say... How come that spring, that little drop, you know, because I went to uh, a place in Madhya Pradesh where Narbada's origin is. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find the origin. There were rocks everywhere. Stones were there. And suddenly one gentleman came and this is where Narbada has originated. And I saw a small drop of water. And suddenly I remembered the huge Narbada. And then this drop, and I was wondering how this drop gradually collates and becomes a small, small rivulet, like, you know, small, narrow, and then other rains and other things come up and they gather and they become a small rivulet and then it becomes a river. And slowly that river becomes connected to other rivers around and then gradually it becomes a part of the ocean. Right. So I was just thinking that how, what force that made that river come. So when there is an inner force, an instinct in which we are also born like that. So it's really connected to life. So when the river comes by that own force, that eternity, some, some kind of natural force that comes up, and you also carry that, and then you want to carry your own thing. So even though you touch the ground, you're actually touching the ground and flowing at the same time. It's very much like us human beings. Mm -hmm. So when you touch and flow, then you start when the other rivulets want to be you next to you, you're hesitant because you want to have your own identity. So you have your own identity, which comes, you know, when you become mature. Otherwise, you don't mind other rivulets come in. And so when you are 18, 16, you get other rivulets also and you become friends and you become colleagues. But then slowly when you become graduate and others, your identity becomes very important. And that time you don't want to mix, you know, with other rivulets. So your ego says, should I get that color with me and travel together or not? Should I do this or not? And then when it goes further, connecting, growing, Sometimes, you know, there is no flow, sometimes there is a hill, sometimes there is a lake. And all these things you know, are happening to you in your life, you know, that you have, you have troubles, then you have uh, dry times, and then you have floods, and you have nothing, and it is a practice like that. So then, slowly as it goes along, it doesn't leave the connection with the ground, and yet it is flowing. And slowly when it comes near the ocean, when it is vast and big, yeah. it says, should I, should I really become part of this ocean? 
what about me in my life? Mm-hmm. But then suddenly it realizes, it is the ego which says, no, but you know, now you have to be ultimately part of the whole world with spirit. At that time, it becomes on the bank, quiet and low and slow. And then it merges with the ocean. Right. And I think at that time, satisfaction is there. It has detached from the earth, become a part of the cosmos. And I think this is what I have always thinking about life. You know, that things go on, students come, they go, you have children, then I have grandchildren, then I have great-grandchildren, I have their husbands and whatnot. So practice goes on, work goes on. But then the whole question is, what, where is that source which came up from the earth, deep from the earth? And where is the connection when you merge with the ocean? Mm-hmm. And what is that link? And what have you done? And I think this is something which I have been thinking about. The journey is now, I'm almost coming closer to the other bank. And when you come near the other bank, you're asking, is that really what you wanted or did you lose your track? When I was studying with my father-in-law, he talked about these things, you know, and then he talked about the culture and then... When I was with Corbusier, I discovered about how to really renew or re research for yourself. And that's what Corbusier did in India. And he talked to me about pact with nature. And in that pact with nature, he talked about really saying that you don't, you are not yourself. Connect with nature and you will discover yourself. And that is what I have been trying to do. And so when you start trying to do that, and then you look at the world today, the world has become very different. The world has become very fascinating because it is in this world you see technology gradually taking over. I know when I came from my family, Vaishnava family, religious family, my grandfather had a carpenter's workshop. Mm -hmm. And then you go and you do things, you know, you see them in a small scale. But I used to go and attend the temples and I was connected to the rituals. And all those things are coming back. And when you link there, then you ask, you ask, am I still rooted? Am I still connected? And then uh, you ask uh, questions for yourself. For example... When my father-in-law was a great scholar and a philosopher, so he asked me a question and he would talk to me about old scriptures and in which one of the rishis is asking, is this what it is? Mm -hmm. Is this what life is about or it is something else? So when I see today this technology and then global connectivity and constant occupation with the mobile and Facebook and whatnot, You are wondering whether that is really what life is or life is something else. Similarly about architecture, is this the theory that we are talking about or we are talking about the people for whom we are building? And so the whole issue is not only connected to one or the other. The world is around, world is going on. And in that world, What is it that you are doing? Are you doing something which is going to be lasting or will it stay or it will disappear? And one of the things that is going to happen in the next three days in the office is we will going to have a dialogue with Palasma and Vitra's Rolf Flenbaum. Okay. And myself. And the dialogue is also connected to this, that where are we? What is the notion of space, form, work? What does movement do? Where is that perception that was there? And is it going to be something which is meaningful or not? I think those are the questions that are bothering me. So what is your sense today on what is the real essence of architecture? I think first is real essence of architecture is connected to, first of all, what is the dwelling? Is it really a place where you go or is it something, you know, that you are only buying and selling? I think that is where the whole question is because we are not talking about human being. We are not talking about environment. We are not talking about habitation. 
and we are not even talking about communication. Then you say, what about the villages? What about towns? What about cities? What about metros? And what is the definition of all this? You know, what are we doing? So if you look at all these together, then there are a couple of issues that come up. And those issues are connected to the cities, meaning of design, and how the cities and other things are really working. You know, long ago you said the language of architecture is to bring life to space and form. Life to space and form. Yes. You talked about density. and You talked about good architecture is that which you cannot describe. Is this still true? Absolutely. I had a talk at the Royal Academy. And uh, I was talking about that architecture is, a building is a living being. And in that living being, how do you celebrate life? And I think in our culture, we talk about nature, human being, their activities, their families. So we talk about the kind of things that we celebrate. And in that celebration, we are connected ourselves to our inner self as well as the outer world. So in case, you know, you connect yourself with your inside, your heart, and then you start looking. For example, when you hear some music, while you are listening to music, you know, suddenly, whether you like or not, either you go away or you start dancing. What is that connection? What is that connection which happens? So today, architecture is a product for a market. But real architecture is, you know, connected to what Vastu Purush, no, what uh, this uh, one epic which was talked about is that, you know, there is a lord, there is a king, you know, Vajra, and the lord is, the deity is there, and he's talking to that, he, king is wanting to talk to the lord, and he was a pious man. So he says, what is it that you want? He says, you know, I like your image. You are so wonderful and you're, you give me all the time blessings. Can I have shrine in the house? And then Lord says, but how will you make a shrine? And then uh, if you make a shrine, would you also make my image? He says, that's what I want to do. But he says, how do you know my image? My image is full of life, full of vibrations, full of other entities, subtle ones. And in that subtle ones, you know, there are many things that you see. You see all the Navarasas that we talk of. So if that is the case, how will you do? So he says, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Then he says, but one of the ways is to know dance. So he says, uh, dance? I don't know dance. But he says, without dance, you can't make my image because the body image is full of lightness. And without dance, there cannot be lightness. Grace cannot be there. It will not smile. It will not float. It will not tell you what, what the whole world is around. So you will make me like a static rock. So he says, what shall I do? He says, in order to know dance, you should know music. But he says, music? He says, yes, don't you remember? He says, you hear music everywhere and you start dancing, you become light, you forget yourself. So he says, how do I learn music? He says, you want to learn music, then you must learn the poetry. He says, poetry, how do I learn? He says, poetry has rhythm, poetry gives you imagination, poetry gives you different kind of perceptions about things that the poet wanted to talk. And through word, he is transmitting the images. And those images become, for you, important because your senses get awakened. So he says, if I want to learn poetry, what do I do? He says, you should know language. So language, I don't know. He says, but without that, we can't communicate. So he says, how do you learn language? He says, you should know phonetics. And without phonetics, the language don't happen. You can't communicate. There's a tonality. There are other words. So he says, what shall I do? He says, but do you know rhythm? 
and then in after that rhythm only you will know what architecture is about so all these senses have to be there and then then you can build my image and then you can have a shrine so and just now i'm remembering stella cramrish right stella cramrish was a great authority in india and she was here and eventually she became a director yes, at yes. the old age of 90 So I was asking her. I said, Stella, I know about all this. Your old writings, I have read some. But tell me, I saw the columns of the temple. So I drew for her columns, which were South Indian columns, you know, which are bulging and going in and out, rounded columns, like you know you see in Ellora and other places. But these are further south. And when you put them together, you get positive and negative. So I said, "What is this whole idea of this bulging in and out and looking all these things?" She says, "You are an architect." I said, "Yes." And he says, "You don't know this." I said, "I'm sorry if I don't know." <laughs> he says, "There is something called energy, and energy has vibrations." Right. So I said, "What does that mean?" He says, "Do you know anything about Vastu Shastra?" I said, "No." Vastu Shastra is a science of environment in which whole thing gets in balance. Vastu is an environment, and Shastra is the science. So, if the science of environment is not understood, how do you get energy? So, it says in all the temples, even if you make a building and you put a, a deity there or image, it is not charged. and he says when that is charged by this vastu and that is done by vastu purusha mandala so vastu is environment purusha is energy and mandala is a diagram if you were to look back at your career yes which project would you pick out as something that still vibrates energy to you i tell you my house and the sangat office also sept but most important is my house and sangat they talk of totally different things in what way they are really one was built you know in 60s the other one was built in 80s because you see the house i built i was thinking about corbusier and uh, i because i work with him and i project i, I supervise his building then i used to be in connection with him So in sixties, I wanted to build the house, and so the first project that I did was looking like a. Though I had come to USA, and I had seen those umbrellas being built at that time, you know, in the fifties. So I thought it's a good idea to have an umbrella, you know, one column and a roof, and then you have a floating roof, so you put glass, and then you make a wall, and a square can be a nice house with a diagonal there, and you have mezzanine on top. When I did the drawings, and then when I made a model, I said, oh, "Horrible!" I said, "This doesn't look right," and neither I want to imitate something. And I had no clue at all. But then, strangely, I had to go to a brick kiln to buy some bricks. And there I saw the brick kiln. You know, so he says, "I have some special burnt bricks, white bricks. I can give you." So he asked the lady to go up, you know, in the mezzanine you know, or other place and bring them. So she was climbing. There was a staircase in front, which there were two columns, and a tin roof was covered, you know, around, and light was filtering. And I was looking and waiting for the lady to come, and then she descended from there on the steps, you know, with on their tagara, you know, on her head, with those bricks. And then those columns, and I said, "My God, what a graceful image!" and i came home and suddenly i drew four columns a staircase and a landing imagining that woman and then when i draw those four columns i found that i can repeat the columns and go on all all sides so that you get a diagram of four squares what do you think right thinking back is the sort of that magical creative moment why was it that a particular image of that woman descending with the with the brick the sense of theater aha uh-huh. the sense of spaces the sense of movement and the kind of proportion that can give that kind of a sense 
there's some energy in that moment. That's right. That's right. There was a lot of energy also then. When I made the drawing, automatically you can close or you get a periphery which you can open or close. So you need an idea, you need a hook, you know, to begin with. Right. And when I was working with Corbusier, I was lost with him. But then I needed a hook which happened to be through the image. Now that image, why it affected me at that particular time, yes. must be that my grandfather's house, there were many staircases. I see. And your unconscious self connected to that. No, no. That is what I'm saying that usually we forget the childhood, we forget the memories. But in those memories lie deep-rooted sensitive elements or images or uh, the kind of uh, impression that you get that you are squeezed and you are released. Right, right. A breathing, breathing image. Now, those images we never remember. And that is where proportions come. But the body, where, body remembers, no? Body remembers. That's right. Well, body remembers, your heart remembers. And as long as your mind is not working, you are better off. Yes, yes. The mind interferes. Yes. So, the intuition, I would call it intuition. Yes. So, the intuition is the most important thing in your whole life, which happened to be that intuition in that spring. Spring? The water spring. And also that intuition to continue, hold on the ground, and yet flow comes from natural experience. See, like for example, if you are standing on foot, do you know where the balance is? So body is the most important thing to know, the sensations within the body. And the sensation within your your sequence of events that happen in life and the sequences or otherwise imagery that you have seen during your childhood, you are growing up, you know, when you are 8, 10, 15. After that, gradually they disappear, they become dormant. So, was there a similar kind of a pandana, a similar kind of a body experience when you started to design Sangat? Yes, because I used to go as a do-do landscapes in the villages. Okay. And before that, you know, the rituals happen on the river bank. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to go to villages and you have to go to the land where farmers and other people are. So you, I had image of the animals, cows, cattle, pig, uh, the hens, you know, all the, uh, all the birds and animals which are their dogs. Then you see a tree and the shade and somewhere people are sitting and gossiping platforms. So Sangat has a lot of platforms. Sangat has an open space. I see. Sangat has trees. And also that dome-like structure is like those old temple with temples, you know, in small towns where there are small shrines. Yeah. Well, these are a lot of references, but can you like identify a particular moment like you did for your house? moment I tell you, when I used to do landscapes, I was 18, when I was in a, the fine arts class. So in that fine arts class, early morning, we would go to do landscape. So we would ride a bike and then go to the villages. And in those villages, this is the scene I would see. So my sense of open spaces, my sense of uh, people living on the platforms and partly in the house, with that small scale, and then the bench, which is also made of earth. So all these things are still dormant and they are very active in my mind. All the time I feel about those spaces. Right. And that is really what happened in the city plan and other things. I always think of those spaces and people are talking about and gathering. Right, right, right. So I connect, you know, intel not intellectually, but like old city of Ahmedabad or old places that you see because... When I was in Chandigarh with Corbusier, we went to some villages. Yes. And they were made of mud. Yes. And you see those kitchens and others and people squatting on the floor. In my house, I used to squat. Even today, when I go home in Pune, we, we sit and eat on the floor. So postures, human, natural postures are part and parcel of my life. All right, let's take a break here. We'll be right back. 
you are listening to architecture talk Welcome back. This is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. We are in the middle of a conversation with B.V. Doshi, the Indian modernist architect. Let me shift slightly and ask you, you know, you were there in the Nehruvian age, in the Nehruvian period, early days of India. Yes. What are your thoughts on the Nehruvian legacy in India? I think first thing was, first thing to me still is pride for yourself, your country and your culture. And I think those, and then my image also is about Tagore, yeah. Aurobindo, Gandhi. Now those are the things, you know, which we don't have. Those role models are still with me, the role models. They are still your role models? Yes, yes. But if we zoom out a little bit and look at the Nehruvian mission in general and the sort of very high expectations we had of what Nehruvian modernization would achieve for India and it's how it would look, place it in the world. The, there are two things, you know. One is Gandhiji talked about villages and village Swaraj. Yes. And Nehru, Nehru talked about the other world, you know, which is the European world. You know, you talk of education, institution, institution building and science and technology. So I think these two things are, when you combine them together, then you get something. Were they successful? Was the Nehruvian age successful? I think partly, yes. You know, if otherwise, we would never have atomic things happen, no? If the Baba Atomic Center was not there, nothing would have happened. Mm -hmm. So science and technology gave us a lot of new industry mm -hmm. also. Industry came because of that. It may not be successful in terms of housing, etc., but it was successful from this. I think city planning was would not have happened if he had not talked about Chandigarh. So I think what he did was very important. He said, we must build institutions, institutions which can give them the knowledge that are required to live in today and tomorrow's world. Second, we must give a place for them to show how the urbanization will take place and how cities would happen. And so he did two things simultaneously. So you don't don't think he was a failure? No, I don't think so. If he was not there, we would not have had all those uh, laboratories and whatnot, and Chandigarh would not have happened, and you or me would not have discussed these issues on this net. I think it is absolutely successful. It's a question of how it has been gradually linked and moved beyond. I think our linking is not working. Why is it not working? Scale. Scale, diversity, diverse opinions and different attitudes to life. If Gandhi is talking that only villages have to improve and Pandit Nehru talks differently and people say, well, both are not correct because they have no visual vision at all, who is going to participate? And that is what is happening today also. Diversity is important for a culture, but if they don't tune in for future, then it is not possible. They don't have a shared vision. That's right. But people lost faith in that vision in the 70s and 80s, did they not, in some ways? No, no, no. You have to remember Indian con conditions and with 40 languages, different states, different belief system. Even now they are talking about Rama and Mahabharata and saying that all these things were there before during mm. Ramayana period. And by saying this, what they are saying is, let's not do that. Only read Ramayana and Mahabharata. But then we would never have a bus or a, we would never have fast trains or aviation. I think the, the difference is because one of the things which is very good in India is the scale, huge scale. Another good thing is the diversity, different languages, different nuances. 
different expressions of art, different expression of culture, different attitudes and different philosophies of life. I think this is wonderful. But that's what creates the chaos. No, no, but that may create chaos. But if they talked about saying, let us say that all these people, when somebody from outside comes and wants to conquer you, they all gather together and at that time they focus on only one thing, the enemy. So the question here is, they are even today in the parliament, that is the case, you know, that nobody is gathering together. But, and the BJP is going the other way around. So these are the issues which we have and they are inherently not correct. So the building of institutions and culture of institutions is very important. What is the philosophy of that institution and will it be sustained over time? So issue would be who is leading that institution and does he create people like those which are like all those religions that happened in India that you create that thought like Shanti Niketan has a thought or IIT on the other hand has one guideline. But if I change a director, if I change the policy and if I change something else, because of political reasons, then it is not going to work. So let me ask a sort of small, more exact scale question. I feel, and you may disagree, but we have not been able to build a strong culture of many, many, many good schools of architecture in India. Why is that? Absolutely. You know, I was just telling somebody yesterday that earlier times in mission period, that is the period which I know of uh, USA, 1960s and 70s, where the word less is more was there. Now with the technology and mobile and everything else and the influence of the West, or even looking at China, but the influence of the West, you go further and you look at this uh, Silicon Valley and the way we are getting connected and we are getting connected with the world around, we are talking now, more or less is more. No, the one is less is more, now more is less. We are now continuously dissatisfied. So what happens is, a land which is public property becomes a developer, a rich man comes and buys that and does whatever he wants. So what do you do? And everybody is doing things what they can and they say other things we will not do. So what is happening? Everybody is buying, doing things and running away halfway. Nobody gives a complete image of what is ideal or what is good. No, but that is the culture of practice. What I am wondering is, you know, SEPT was a great school, uh, still is a great school. But, there, you know, now we have 150, 160 schools of architecture in India. 500. 500, oh my God. Okay, 500 schools of architecture. There is not a good culture, there's not a strong... Because a teacher is who, he was only graduated yesterday from a school whose teacher was graduated from another school and they were never taught. So it is all now on paper that I am having a syllabus, I am having a lecturer, I am having assistant professor, a professor, etc. But none of them have experience, No, no, nobody has practiced and nobody is there. So this is really what happens to religion. The religion is not a very easy thing. Religion, religion is like going, becoming a monaster, monastic life. Now, if that becomes a market, then I also get a monk. I just change my dress. The school is the same because who is who is sponsoring the school? The person who wants to do business and make money. So the intent is different than the council of architecture. Who are heading the council? Who have never practiced? And who is telling them? The government. Because we don't agree. So what can you do? It sounds like a very difficult uh, situation. No, no, difficult and that is the reason I wanted you to be here. But <laughs> there was unfortunately something happened. Yes, the larger and in broad institutional question. I think the institution must have a vision. And that vision has to be beyond returns.
the institution's vision must be that I'm going to put my life there without any return. Yes, no, no, I agree with Then only I will ask myself a true question. Then I will ask myself and, and become critical. And then I will only gather people who have the same view. That is what I did in the school. Yes, you did. And that was what made SEPT into an extremely strong and important institution. Yeah, now on the other hand, even if you look at Chandigarh or you look at Delhi or any other school, what has happened? So the issue is the same, you know, whether SEPT is an exception that happened and whatever it is. But the point is you need a devoted kind of attitude and kind of people who are around and they can reinterpret a curriculum given by a council or they can find a way to do and they can succeed. But nobody wants to do. Everybody wants to have a hundred thousand rupees salary per month. They are very happy. They don't have to practice. But engineering schools are doing well. Engineering culture is strong. No, no, no. Engineering schools, because they are technologically to be proved. If a building collapses, what do you do? So all the engineers or all the medical, medical people, the education may not be very good, but they, they can't allow the patient to die, no? So the issue is, is it life and death? Architecture is not life and death. I am giving you a product. I am giving you a product because you want to have a house. I don't give you a house that you talked about in the architecture. I give you a flat which I don't call even a rooms. I don't call them for sleeping, etc. You call BHK and whatnot. So what have you done? We have changed the whole nomenclature of, of architecture into elements of things which have nothing to do with one another. Yes. yes. So it's all product oriented now. So let me shift to a slightly parallel institution, you know, a new institution which has become very strong in India is fashion. Indian fashion is uh, doing extremely well. You remove the fashion show, you remove the money. You tell me why everybody is wanting to have a new dress is the same as everybody likes to go to a new movie. Mm -hmm. These are all market-oriented things and they are all luxury. But, you know, they are what you can call entertainment. So, if you can delight, you can have entertainment, if you can have alluring things, you know, for your life to impress people, those are going to thrive, like also the cover of a soap. Like Bollywood. It is, but like you go, you go and buy. Why packaging has changed now? Why packaging has changed? Why advertisements in the newspapers have changed their tone and color and presentation? I mean, all that media agency is talking to you, how in shortest possible time you can attract people. And what you're talking on the other hand is architecture, which is going to be there. So once you make a building, it is going to last. Now, whether that lasting building where you have family growing over children and grandchildren, what kind of influence does it do on the life of those young generations? Now, this is something which is fundamental, which one is not talking. One is not talking about their conglomerate image as a street or as a community or something which has meaningful through which people are or even the, those who live there give you something more. In the old cities of Pune and other places, even in Ahmedabad, or even I'm sure in Punjab, the city was made out of dwellings which had culture, inherent culture. Family was talking about cultural issues. They became writers, poets and whatnot. And they looked at the life and gave them a new impression. So you could get a farmer or you could get a goldsmith, you could get a tailor or you could get a businessman or a teacher. And they were talking about scripts where they talked about long-lasting values. And long-lasting values, which means what is going to last longer, what is going to give you more pleasure and what is going to give you something beyond a normal human beings asking that need to survive. I think we are talking about survival at the lowest level. So, so let us talk about the rasa of life. I mean, what is the rasa of life? 
So I tell you, you know, if you talk about the Navarasas and if you talk about the Rasas, it is actually what I just now told you about Vishnu Dharmottar Purana. That unless we are having cultural institutions, now even the museums are becoming marketplaces, but supposing that in each town there was a place and there was a, a cultural uh, revolution in a sense, you arrange competitions, you arrange places. For example, let's take the Gufa. Yes. Gufa is, I think, perhaps a very interesting example. It's an amazing building. Gufa was a challenging job. So first thing is, do you have a challenge? Second, what is that challenge? Is it measurable or unmeasurable? Gufa was an unmeasurable challenge imposed by itself, accepted by the client. When I accepted the challenge, then the whole question is, I want to know what is the definition of a place for an artist or a place for somebody. So every building that you do with a brick wall or stone or concrete and make a box or whatever that shape is, it is still a building and it doesn't tell you more. So can we really go beyond that building and can we say, is the building going to tell me something more than what it is? and talk about the invisible forces that will affect me subtly. How does it do that? That is where Gufa comes in because I said a normal building, we ask as a teacher or to the student that look, a building must have a foundation. Walls should be more or less straight. The roof should be more connected to climate and it can be flat or the window can be in the right place or as what size and what not. So there was a system of theory which I talked and then my theory was connected to historical theory and what I learned. But if I say these theories are going to be thrown out and I'm going to say it is going to be delightful, it is going to be indescribable, it is going to be enigmatic and it is going to be something that a nature would have normally produced like a cockroach and a butterfly or maybe a eagle or a tiger. Why they are made like that? Why the snake is like that? So if you make something which is not describable, then you start challenging yourself about how to create that animal. And I think this is precisely what I did. So now it has become an enigmatic, undescribable experience and outside and inside and tells you about something which is like a mythological element. And I think that mythology now has attracted children, old people, because they don't ask any questions. They don't know what to ask because there are no definitions. So I have created a fluid, a fluid architecture. Architecture which is moving, architecture which is uh, giving you different experiences. It talks to climate, it talks to the local place, it talks to craftsmen, it talks to skilled people and it can be enjoyable. As a result, then there is a gallery and so now it has become a public place. So now it is the most important public place in Ahmedabad, which is not finite, which is not done in a normal way. And I think today, if you ask me, I would say, should not the public place be something where children and old people and others and scholars can come and each one has a share of their own and they get delighted about it. This is what Go fights. It is indeed. Wonderful. It's been a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you very much for taking the time out. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash. I am the host of the show and our show's producer is Elizabeth Ambenhauer. If you like the show, please do remember to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And also, take a moment and rate us on iTunes. Thank you very much, and see you next time.